You know, so many people coming together to help out. And now the story now on uh, people that are helping our most vulnerable through this uh, pandemic. City Council President candidate Carl Stokes actually teamed up with a few small businesses to deliver hot meals to senior citizens. Normally, these seniors would get a meal from a program in the city to encourage eating and congregating together. But since the pandemic and we have that uh, social distancing, they haven't been able to do that. Obviously, people are hungry uh, and, and uh, the seniors can't get out uh, and they certainly can't get a hot meal uh, easily, uh, at, at particularly at a particular socioeconomic uh, strata. And that's quite frank, uh, and that's quite direct. Uh, and so to be able to bring seniors who are living uh, in our inner cities uh, a hot meal uh, is, is a fantastic thing. They're hungry um, and they're in need. And so we're glad to be able to do that. They'll be delivering 200 meals to seniors throughout the week. You know, there's a whole lot of misinformation about the different COVID-19 symptoms. Tonight, we're working for your health, the 10 signs you should look out for. Plus, with everything that's going on right now, we want to bring you more good news. Later on, we're going to take a look at some of the positive headlines from across the country. You're watching WMAR2 News at 5. Download the WMAR2 News app on all of your streaming devices and watch local content any time of day. All right, new research on how the coronavirus spreads may have you leaving your shoes at the door. The CDC says testing at Chinese hospitals found high concentrations of the virus on the floors. And they say the virus was able to live on healthcare workers' shoes. They were tracking it to other parts of the hospital where patients hadn't been, like the pharmacy. Testing also revealed high amounts of the virus on computer mice, trash, and also doorknobs. You know, there is a lot of information and misinformation out there about COVID-19 and the different symptoms. Melissa Rainey breaks down 10 signs you should look out for. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that if you have been exposed to coronavirus, any or all symptoms will usually present themselves within 2 to 14 days of exposure. Fever is a key sign of COVID-19, but not everyone has a core temperature of exactly 98.6 degrees. Some people run a little cooler or hotter. Experts say not to fixate on a number. Try to find your normal temperature and check in later in the day when fevers tend to present themselves. Shortness of breath is one of the more troubling signs of the virus. If you feel like you can't take a good deep breath, call your doctor right away. A dry cough, and not just the kind that you have to clear your throat, one that you feel deep in your chest. Chills and body aches are common with the flu, but they could also mean you have COVID-19, especially if you don't feel you're getting better after a week or so. Sudden confusion is one sign that you may need to seek emergency care, especially if you have other critical symptoms like trouble breathing. Five other symptoms that have been associated with the virus are digestive issues, pink eye, loss of smell and taste, fatigue, and a headache, sore throat, and congestion. While most of these are not worrisome on their own, trust your body and contact your doctor with any questions or concerns. I'm Melissa Rainey. Follow us on Instagram and see what WMAR2 News is doing behind the scenes. You're watching the station that's working for you. Now, WMAR2 News at 5. Coronavirus treatment can range from $9,000 to nearly $100,000. Coming up, what you need to know to make so you can make it and deal with that expensive bill. Companies and organizations across the country are making face masks to help fight the spread of the coronavirus. And a few groups are focusing on making them to protect newborn babies. And the coronavirus has changed the workforce in drastic ways. But what happens when the pandemic is over? Coming up, we're looking at why some experts say the way Americans work may not be the same. As the number of cases of the COVID-19 continues to rise, so does the cost of treatment. But the Trump administration has expressed a commitment to ensuring Americans aren't surprised with some expensive hospital bills. WMAR 2 News reporter Mark Roper takes a look at how much a hospital stay for the coronavirus could cost you. The pandemic is expected to cost the healthcare industry billions of dollars, and patients worried about their health also might be wondering how much treatment is going to cost them. 
So we asked Johns Hopkins Medicine Senior Medical Director, Dr. Scott Berkowitz, to find out. This is about people. It's about patients and families and trying to do right by them and trying to help all as a big team to get through this together. Researchers at the Peterson and Kaiser Family Foundation took a look at the cost to hospitals, patients, and providers for COVID-19 and compared it to similar cost of treatment for pneumonia. They found inpatient treatment for COVID-19 could cost employer health insurance and the people enrolled in those plans more than $9,000 for patients without complications and more than $20,000 for those with serious complications or those who have underlying health issues. And the price can skyrocket the longer a patient stays in the hospital, especially if they need a ventilator. More than four days with a ventilator, that cost in that hospitalization tends to cost more than $90,000. Uh, while it's uh, more in the 30s for those who are hospitalized for four days or less. Depending upon a patient's level of coverage, much of that may be paid by their insurance. But the study also found nearly one out of every five patients admitted in network for pneumonia ended up with a surprise bill out of network, something a White House spokesperson says the Trump administration is working on to prevent. Typically, employer-sponsored plans will have about a $1,400 on average deductible. Uh, and also, in addition to that, the out-of-pocket expenses that may be expected for a patient who's hospitalized with a COVID-related infection could be as up as high as $1,400 as well. The nonprofit group Fair Health estimates total hospital charges for COVID-19 treatment in the U.S. could range from about $360 billion to nearly $1.5 trillion. Meanwhile, the healthcare industry will have to figure out who will pay for it? There is some support that's coming through the stimulus bill to the hospitals, and I know that that's being worked out right now. Uh, and I think that that's to help keep the providers and healthcare industry harmless. But clearly, there's tremendous complexity here around the financial side, and I would imagine that some of these things need to be worked out over time. All right, thanks, Mark, for that report. You know, other costs for people with health insurance to consider is their out-of-pocket maximum. For some plans, that could be nearly as high as $10,000. But for the uninsured, there are social workers and financial support staff at hospitals who can connect the patients with programs and services to help them get through this. You know, Maryland airports are set to receive up to more than $100 million in aid for their relief during the COVID-19 pandemic. The aid is part of the CARES Act and will help support current operations and replace money that was lost from the airport in decline in traffic. 18 of the state's airports will receive the funds and it will go towards things like payroll, utilities, airport debt as well. Companies and organizations across the country are making face masks to help fight the spread of the coronavirus. But a few groups in Virginia are working on something a little different. Face shields to keep newborn babies from getting sick. Brendan King spoke to the head of the RVA makers about their important work. As long as there's a need out there, we're going to continue to fill that need. When business slowed at Burt Green's Henrico Manufacturing Company Solar Mill due to the pandemic. None of that is as rewarding or fulfilling as what I'm doing right now. He quickly adapted his workshop to help those on the front lines. By creating face shields for first responders fighting COVID-19. This is one of the first face shields that we did and it uses an elastic cord and it's pretty comfortable actually but green says he then received the call from the children's hospital of richmond at vcu for protection of all ages and it totally makes sense because you know if an adult would need protection so would you know a newborn inspired by doctors in thailand he scaled down an adult sized face mask to fit babies just days old from the time we got the request to i had the first prototype done was less than two and a half hours when anyone can be living with the coronavirus without showing symptoms, experts found putting face masks on babies too risky. But one of the reasons why these are so needed for infants is because you can't use a regular face mask with them because it's too constraining. As president of RVA Makers, Green and a handful of other Richmond nonprofits now collaborate to send face shields all over. And they are shipping uh, 500 of those to a, to a Navajo uh, reservation as we speak. I feel very small on all of this. It's it's really been an incredible team effort. A team effort for the greater good. It's everyone coming together to try to figure out how we can help those that are in greatest need right now. That was Brendan King reporting. Green also says so far the face shield is really just a prototype. 
but to date, RVA Makers has collaborated with Build RVA and Good Work Society to make thousands of masks for first responders. Well, we go from severe weather yesterday, a confirmed tornado in Caroline County to snow in some parts of the state right now. That confirmed tornado, no injuries, no deaths reported out in Henderson, Maryland and Caroline County was an EF zero winds at 80 miles per hour was on the ground for 4.9 miles. And right now the current scene here at Wisp Ski Resort in Garrett County, elevation a little over 2,800 feet. It's big snowflakes falling out of the sky and those snowflakes are picking up in intensity all across much of Mountain Maryland down into portions of West Virginia. Wouldn't be surprised if we even get a little bit of that around here before it's all said and done as we go through the overnight hours. Temps in the 50s in most locations, lots of clouds around as the rain showers start to build in during the overnight hours. A chance at a few flakes north and west of the city as we get towards the early morning hours of tomorrow and then more sunshine with highs only in the 50s. We'll talk about more cooler conditions and additional chances for rain coming up in just a few minutes. All right, last night at 11, Eddie Keatum uh, showed us what was going on in our own backyard about this storm. But the death toll from this storm system that rolled across our south and up the east coast yesterday is now up to at least 34. And the Weather Service said the severe weather spawned at least 40 tornadoes all the way from Texas to South Carolina. And radar data suggests some tornadoes in Mississippi were on the ground for more than an hour and might have been tracked at least 100 miles. And at least 12 people died in the state of Mississippi. Nine people were killed in storm-related accidents in the South Carolina area. Eight in Georgia, three people lost their lives in Tennessee, and one each in Arkansas and North Carolina. And that's why I'm so proud to endorse Joe Biden for President of the United States. Well, there it is. Former President Barack Obama endorses Joe Biden to be the next president. Former President Obama made the official endorsement of his former vice president in a nearly 12-minute video message that came out today. And the endorsement was expected, of course, once Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders dropped out of the race just last week. And Sanders endorsed Biden on Monday, five days after suspending his own campaign. All right, let's take a look at this coronavirus on the national level right now. The president said he would like to get the country up and running as soon as May, but many governors and health experts are warning lifting this ban so early could be detrimental to the country. And some state governors are now saying that they're going to go against what the president is saying and trying to reopen the country too early. And New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is now forming a coalition with governors of six other states, and they're going to decide when to reopen the economy. And out there on the West Coast, three other states are doing the same. Ultimately, the virus is going to determine when we really can safely reopen, not only in general, but in a particular location. And the White House is also promising continued support for small businesses, but warning that the program will likely run out of money by the end of the week. All right, and also coming up, we have the, uh, the coronavirus has changed this country's workforce in profound and unsettling ways, the likes that we have never seen before. And after the epidemic is over, then what? How do we go back to work? What kind of work will we go back to? Here's Chris Conti with a look at what the nation is facing. She was... Um, feeling really sad, and I had had the same kind of conversations with her. As a high school biology teacher, this is the one place Mariah Toomey never imagined would become her classroom. But if you could be flexible with her in terms of like due dates, that would be really helpful. Crammed inside a one bedroom apartment in the middle of downtown Boston. I'm used to like being up and moving and interacting with them and not being like behind a computer seated all day and that's like been my reality since we closed. Like millions of other Americans, working from home was never a possibility for Mariah until now. And while it's no substitute for the classroom, she's still able to teach. I've actually been in contact with some kids like a lot more than I was kind of in school. You also lose the kind of the the, the human interaction that just comes with a smiling face, a warm greeting, um, a hearty hello. That is Steve Pemberton. He's the chief human resources officer for WorkHuman. They have spent years studying how this nation works. 
this is not going to be a matter because of somehow we ring the bell and then, you know, it's kind of like we get the all clear and then, you know, humanity goes back to doing things the way that we did them. On the other side of the epidemic, Steve believes many companies will find themselves re-examining work from home policies. You begin to realize, no, you didn't lose anything in the way of productivity because you didn't have a choice. It's not just productivity. With coronavirus keeping countless people home, it's also kept them out of their cars. Steve thinks many companies will see the positive impact the epidemic is having on congestion in major metropolitan areas, pushing some businesses to say, maybe we don't need people commuting as much. It's going to change things profoundly because part of this realization uh, is going to be that the way we were is what got us to where we are. And many companies spend tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on office space. Once the epidemic is over, they may decide they no longer need that physical space. There's no facet of, of, of work that this has not touched and won't touch for the foreseeable future. I'm not feeling like I'm providing like the same level of education online. For teachers like Mariah Toomey, who never thought they'd be working from home, this epidemic has provided a lesson in resiliency. And just like missing seeing kids every day, missing like colleague interaction, um, so that's like been hard too. In Boston, I'm Chris Conti reporting. All right, coming up, we caught up with Ravens running back Mark Ingram to see what he's been up to. And we got a special surprise from someone in his family. Plus, the coronavirus is forcing some people to find a creative ways to stay in shape, how a local trainer is helping people work out with what they have in their homes. Like us on Facebook and see how WMAR2 News is working for you. You're watching WMAR2 News with Jamie Costello and Kelly Swoop. Well, now we can relate. You know, our favorite athletes are just like you and I, uh, staying at home in quarantine. I want you to check this situation out. Watch this. The Ravens running back, Mark Ingram, took some time today for a Zoom call with the Baltimore media. Mark is currently at home in Florida with his four kids, and it didn't take long for one of his little ones, the Zoom Bomb Dada. Watch. I get to spend a lot of time with him right now, so that makes me happy. Here comes is, is it, is right it a... here. Mila, can you get out of here, baby, for a little bit, please? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Go. <laughs> Lock that. A running or is that what one would deserve? No, I think he deserves that. Um, he... 1,000 yards rushing, 1,000 yards receiving. Um, he's just a high percentage or high volume. There you go. And regarding his trading during quarantine, Mark says not much has changed for him. He goes through his own program, and the NFL approved virtual offseason workouts with coaches on Monday. But come football season, Lamar is going to go Zoom 42 on three. Hey, listen to this. Hopkins and men's lacrosse coach Dave Petromala have agreed to part ways. I can't believe this as the program looks to move in a different direction. We, Mar, uh, Dave Petromala won 207 games and lost 93, and Petro is the winningest coach that Johns Hopkins men's lacrosse has ever, ever had. He led the team to 18 NCAA tournament appearances, including seven trips to the Final Floor, four, and the Blue Jays appeared in four national championships, and they won two of them. The team also took home a pair of Big Ten tournament titles, and the university has launched a NAS national search to find a replacement. Dave Petromala, I'm telling you, a former player and a former coach at Hopkins. You know, with local gyms and also our parks closed, many of us have uh, taken our workout routine right here to online. And one local trainer is still connecting with clients virtually. WMAR 2 News' Sean Stepner tells us how. Oh. For so many trying to stay fit during Damn. quarantine, it's all about working out with what you have. Right, man, Owen Murray knows that day. better than we anyone. So. We're more um, athletic-based, but we have a lot of adult, regular, everyday Joes and Sues that come in and get in a good workout. He's a personal trainer and gym manager of Sweat Performance in Timonium. We have ropes, racks, dumbbells, barbells, 
sleds. But for the last few weeks, he's been the personal trainer and gym manager of the Murray Garage in Lutherville. We've been becoming extremely creative. By using household items for exercise. Using towels as hurdles, chairs, things to do dips. Every morning, he holds his metabolic conditioning class online. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. He tells me he's still getting his usual 15 to 20 participants. First lunges. He's even doing a free 30-minute live session on Saturday on the gym's Facebook page. Switch sides. Now, Murray may be the most physically fit in his family, but he's not even the strongest in his own home. His wife, Gina, is a nurse practitioner. She's on the front lines working with COVID patients. How is it being the spouse of a healthcare worker during these times? I mean, it is really rough, man, because there's times where I'm just worried about her, for one, and at the same time worried about all these, these people that may think that she may be bringing the COVID-19 into it. Obviously, as a husband, I'm worried about her, but at the same time, I'm so proud of her. A feeling of pride felt by so many for heroes like Gina. In Baltimore, Sean Stepner, WMAR2 News. Well, what a difference a day makes out there all across the region. This Tuesday, much quieter compared to where we were yesterday. We had a line of severe weather rolling through the area, actually multiple rounds of severe weather. And we're going to start to ask the question over the next couple of days, where is spring, especially across certain parts of the state? where they will actually be experiencing winter time conditions. So the cold air train is going to remain in place. The upper level pattern shows lots of blue and purple, and that's not what you want to see. Usually this time of year, we want to be talking about sunshine and warmer conditions, and we just really won't have it over the next couple of days ahead. Instead, we do have a chance of snow out there. For most of us, it will be liquid, but snow mixes in north and west overnight tonight, and especially out over the mountains where it is already snowing and low temperatures right around 36 to 40 degrees. Speaking of the snow, here it is live. You can see a coating of that on the roof at Whisk Ski Resort. This is about three and a half hours away from Baltimore in Garrett County. You can see the visibility quite reduced as the flakes continue to come down and get a little bit bigger with time. And that snow is coming down at a pretty good clip with a decent dusting there starting to show up on the grassy surfaces. Around here, it is much quieter. The camera is not shaking for a change. Green grass below and gray skies above out there in many locations and temperatures holding steady close to 60 at the Inner Harbor, but everybody else is generally in the lower 50s. What a difference a day makes 10 to 15 degrees cooler out there in many spots. 37 in Charleston, West Virginia right now with snow, 42 in Pittsburgh, and temps below freezing out on the other side of the mountains. Eventually that cold air has to come somewhere and it will be coming here. You can see the stream of moisture coming through West Virginia right now that will be moving in during the overnight hours. And once again, can't rule out a few flakes north and west of town as we get into the overnight period. Once again, radar a little bit less bark than bite here, but we are starting to filter in that precipitation and it will take over once we get towards about the 11 o'clock newscast tonight with meteorologist Patrick Pete. He may be seeing some snow on the radar up across portions of Frederick and Carroll County. As we go through the overnight period, some of that will even get into northern Baltimore County, southern portions of Pennsylvania, and all of this is long gone as we get towards tomorrow afternoon. Tons of sunshine, but much cooler, at least temperature-wise, with a northwesterly breeze at 5 to 10 and highs only in the 50s and a couple more showers there to the north as we get towards Thursday afternoon. And then again on Friday, we'll have another little round of precipitation moving through. Speaking of the snow, how much are we expecting? Well, not much around here, but as you get out into the mountains, upwards of one to three inches expected in the higher terrain. And they'll get a couple rounds of this, not only tonight, but again tomorrow night and then again Friday night into Saturday. They'll be looking at a little bit more snow. 39 degrees around here, cloudy. Most of us see liquid, some snow showers north and west of the city. 36 in Westminster, 36 in Parkton. Best areas, of course, to see the snow as we go through the overnight hours. 53 as we get towards tomorrow morning, rain and snow showers, decreasing clouds and cool conditions. And pollen count, it's down for a change, so allergy sufferers don't have to really worry on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It is back with us. So is the sunshine on Thursday, breezy too. And then more rain as we go through Friday as well as Saturday and Sunday with temperatures getting back close to 60 degrees by the beginning of next week.
You know, you have to admit, during this COVID-19 crisis, we are seeing extraordinary people do extraordinary things. And I hope you've had a chance to watch the news and see what your people are doing. And you know something? That's good to know. An Ohio postal worker is delivering much more than mail. Kyle West, also known as Mailman Kyle, is dropping off essential items like milk and toilet paper to high-risk individuals on his route. It started with this note. In it, Kyle volunteered to pick up items for residents. That I delivered a little under 400 of those notes, and I've heard something from pretty much every person. Mailman Kyle says he doesn't want anything in return. He asks everyone to do their part to help keep their postal workers safe. Hospitals are running low on protective gear, so with the ski season cut short, some skiers in Utah are helping by donating their goggles to medical workers on the front lines. There's not much we can do right now. We can't ski and everyone's feeling a little bit lost and pushing our goggles into the mail and sending them out to someone who really needs them right now is the best that we can do. Their initiative is called Goggles for Docs and organizers have collected more than 400 pairs so far. Elizabeth Carpenter lost her husband Bill, a corrections officer, more than two years ago. Since then, his uniforms have brought her a sense of comfort. But Elizabeth realized they could serve a better purpose, so she's been transforming her husband's uniforms into masks to donate to his former facility. The corrections officers have been great to me and uh, when I needed them since Bill died, and I just thought I could pay them back. Each mask comes with a wallet-sized photo of Bill. Her kindness is good to know. Yeah, we are stepping it up. Thank you for stepping it up. We've got more news coming your way. WMR2 News at 6, right at you. You're watching the station that's working for you. Now, WMAR 2 News at 6. And thanks for joining us for WMAR News at 6. I'm Kelly Swoop. Hello, oh, and thank you for joining us here. We're doing things a little differently and telling you the news. We, too, are practicing social distancing, so today I'll be working from home. I want to get you caught up right now on the coronavirus pandemic. And first off, we're gonna tell you about this nursing home. Patient rights as patients fight for their lives. And some family members and residents in a Carroll County nursing home say that they are frustrated, frustrated over the silence that they're getting surrounding their care. Let's go to WMAR 2 News. Jeff Hager who has more on this story tonight. Jeff. Two women tell us that their loved ones have contracted the coronavirus here at the Westminster Healthcare Center. Yet to date, they say the facility refuses to answer any questions about the extent of the outbreak here. 74-year-old John Mack is hospitalized on life support with a ventilator, and 74-year-old Doug Harrison received care in isolation. Both men reside at the Westminster Health Care Center, both tested positive for COVID-19, and both of their families say the center has made it difficult to learn anything about their condition. When I told them who I was, they said I needed a four-digit code to find out anything about my dad, who I have power over. He has the COVID-19. He went in on Friday with it. They ended up, RRT was called in, rapid response team, on Friday. They then put him in the CCU, critical care unit, and he's been on a ventilator ever since. When my dad had a stroke and went in there, I made sure they saw my face every day. So I want them to make sure they know that I'm there watching. And now I'm not there watching anymore, so I have no idea what's going on. Irene Crack's daughter last saw her grandmother on her 99th birthday back in March. And while she's not tested positive to her knowledge, she claims neither the center nor the health department will divulge the extent of the outbreak. She has received a letter which stated someone had become infected at the center. But it went on to say people would only be notified if their loved one tested positive. Reporting in Carroll County, Jeff Hager, WMAR 2 News. All right, Jeff, thank you. Now, right now, we have almost 10,000, 10,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases here in the state of Maryland. 302 people have lost their lives because of this virus. 40 of those deaths have happened over the last 24 hours, and that's the largest increase. Baltimore County had the most deaths of all the counties overnight. They had 10 new reported deaths, but only 16 new reported cases. That's the lowest one-day increase that we've seen this month for Baltimore County. 
All right, thanks a lot, Jamie. You know, starting tomorrow, shoppers and employees in Anne Arundel County have to wear a mask. That order came out today from the county health officer. The masks don't have to be those uh, special N95 surgical masks as long as it covers your nose and your mouth. A homemade mask, a scarf, or any type of neckwear will do just fine. So we can help avoid spreading any kind of virus by wearing a mask, doing the cleaning and so forth. We're going to do that. Yeah, you should be wearing a mask. Yeah, you should be wearing gloves when you go to work because you're around people and we don't want you getting sick. And if you violate that order, it could come with a $500 fine. More companies now like uh, Walmart and Amazon have started taking employees temperatures at work. Home Depot and Starbucks are providing thermometers and they're asking workers to self monitor. And now there's a debate if stores should be taking customers temperatures as well. Some small grocery stores are doing it. They say they are now using the non invasive thermal cameras at store entrances. There are questions now about how this could be done on a larger scale. In order to do it for you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers who are coming through uh, the doors every day, um, it you know, requires a, a lot more people um, you know, to, 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 to carry out these safety checks. You know, the people themselves need to be trained. Um, they're probably going to require enhanced security at the stores. Walmart's executive vice president of corporate affairs says the government would have to direct the company to start taking customers' temperatures because of concerns about privacy issues. Well, testing for COVID-19 is taking place at the Pimlico Racetrack in Pimlico, of course. This is in northwest Baltimore. And the site opened on Friday last week, and we are told 96 people have already gone through and been tested. 115 were scheduled to be tested today. Now, it's going to take a few days to receive results. You just can't show up. Uh, you have to make an appointment, and you need a referral from a health care provider. And the site is only set up for drive-through testing at this point here in Pimlico. And the COVID-19 pandemic is a stressful one. You know it for so many of you out there, especially those who put their fertility treatments or adoptions on hold. Couples are left wondering if this change is going to be, you know, their, their chance for a baby is fading. Everything's in limbo. WMAR 2 News, Megan Knight has a very important story to tell tonight. Megan? When 26-year-old Andrea Leone married her husband Irving in 2013, they couldn't wait to start a family. But bringing a baby into this world proved to be far more challenging than they ever realized. We've had eight pregnancy losses. Um, that's our fertility journey. We've conceived all of them naturally. Actually, we can't figure out why I can't maintain a pregnancy. Each pregnancy started with hope and optimism and ended in tragedy. After the eighth loss, Andrea says she felt helpless. I felt like I was at a dead end. I didn't know where else to go. So she turned to the Cade Foundation, a nonprofit that helps couples dealing with infertility. She received a grant to cover costs with IVF. And just as she was about to start the process, the coronavirus hit the U.S. Andrea found herself having to make a very difficult decision. And I was, you know, really debating to move forward with treatment because I'm like, I've been through so many losses. I, I can't take this chance and lose it. She decided to put the treatments on hold, and she's not alone. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine has recommended all IVF treatments that had not already started prior to the coronavirus outbreak to be temporarily halted. They recommended that the people stop and wait until this, this pandemic, this crisis has passed, and that we know more about the virus and the way that it can impact pregnancies and embryos 